Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. I know some people are still dialing in, but that's okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the provider supports meeting. Um, you'll see the virtual uh, meeting protocols on your screen. <clears throat> Let's see, it looks like some people, okay, there we go, more people are dropping in. So you'll see uh, the virtual meeting protocols on your screen. I know most of us on this call are very well familiar, um, but uh, just as a reminder, please keep yourself on mute. Um, we encourage use of the chat. Um, if you have questions, comments, feedback uh, during any of the conversations, please feel free to put it in the chat. There will also be times uh, for a large group discussion where you, uh, you guys can unmute and share verbally, um, but uh, please feel free to use the chat anytime. All right, and we're gonna start with introductions. Um, just to make sure we go through everybody, I'll just call people out by name. And when your name is called, please share your name, where you are located, your role, and the icebreaker question is your favorite book or podcast that you would recommend others dive into this summer. Okay, and also for those um, that may not be able to unmute and share verbally, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. But for now, I will just go down the list. So first I have Brian. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Trimble. I am one of the tri-chairs for Provider Supports. I also own a early learning center in Spokane, Washington, and I'm the executive director and uh, my role. I already did that. My favorite book, uh, it's Animal Farm by George Orwell is my favorite book. I would recommend that to everyone. So. A classic. Thanks, Brian. Um, next, I have Ruth. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Ruth Kellenberger, and I live here in Pasco, Washington. I have a, a home day, a home daycare here in Pasco. Yeah. Thank you. Looks like I have somebody in the chat. So Dave, um, Dave from the Office of Catholic Schools, Director of Early Childhood Education, um, and he has a podcast to recommend how I built this. It's a fun podcast to listen to. Thanks, Dave. This is really just a way for us to collect podcasts and book recommendations. So <laughs> jotting it down. All right. So next on the list, I have Sandra. Good morning, Sandra Nelson, uh, Director of Prem ABC Child Care center in Southeast Seattle. Um, and I, um, my birthday was last week. And um, I went to San Francisco to see Harry Potter uh, play and it was wonderful. Happy birthday. And that sounds so fun. I love, I love weekend trips to San Francisco. All right. I'm gonna read some of the chat intros really quick. So we have Rochelle, she's uh, the director of Foundations of Faith Children's Academy in Lacey. Uh, her favorite books are the Eve Duncan series by Iris Johansson. I have not heard of that, Rochelle. I'm definitely gonna check that out. And we have Dee Hirsch, Seattle Early Childhood Director. She recommends Margaret Albright biography. And we have Rebecca Knox, Associate Director of Early Learning, Provider Services and Early Achievers Regional Coordinator for Central Washington. Um, not sure that I have a true favorite book. There are so many, I love thrillers. So I would say anything by Stephen King is pretty good. 
I totally agree, Rebecca. I love Stephen King. And uh, we have Gloria Vasquez. She has a family child care uh, center in Wenatchee and her favorite book is The Four Agreements. And we have Berta Artiga. She's a child care provider from Pasco. Good morning. I'm gonna take a break from the chat for a second and go back to the verbal, but I will come back to the chat. Um, so next to introduce, I have Kara. Hello. I'm Kara Anderson Aarons, and I am um, uh, the executive director for Fauntleroy Children's Center and the Fauntleroy Community Service Agency in West Seattle. And I have a 45 minute commute because I live in Mount Lake Terrace. <laughs> so my um, favorite thing right now is listening to History This Week. It's a podcast by the History Channel. And it gives 30 minute little segments of what happened, you know, 200 years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago on this date. And I, you find out some really fun, fun things um, and some really thought provoking things as well. So I recommend if you um, don't want a new podcast, but you want something, um, just a little mini series, they have something out on reconstruction that I learned so much about what, um, how how race relations um how we are today the legacy of where we are today was built way back um the way that we um handled or didn't handle the aftermath of the civil war and stuff that i did not learn in school um so anyway that's my recommendation thanks kara all right, um, in the chat, we have Hillary Prentice from Sammamish Montessori School in Redmond and uh, the PNMA MA board. And she loves all of the Amy Tan books. Yes, I also love Amy Tan books. And we have Susan Brown, founder um, and CEO of Kids Co in Seattle. Um, oh yes, wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, I, that is such a fun podcast and favorite guilty pleasure book series is Outlander. And we have Julie Schroth in Port Orchard, owner and director of Creator Kids Learning Center. She doesn't have a recommendation to share, but she's loving all of your guys's. So that's the mode I'm into, Julie, just writing them down. Um, okay, we're going to do one more in the chat and then I'll go back uh, to the Verbal share outs. So uh, Brett, uh, we have Brenna, uh, the director at the Goddard School in Issaquah. Um, and she said, it's been, I've been so long in school, in school so long, I haven't read a book for pure enjoyment in years, but I did just buy Mean Baby by Selma Blair that I'm looking forward to reading. Oh, happy to hear you're getting back into pleasure reading. I always missed that when I was in school. All right. So next on the phone, I have Carol. Uh, you talking about Carol Morris? Oh yes, sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Carol and I'm an early childhood educator. Uh, I run a home-based childcare in Lakewood, Washington. And a book that I enjoyed reading, uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. That's a good book, thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, in the chat, we have Dieta Simmons from Cultivate Learning. Um, she said, not sure if I recommend it, but right now she's reading Street Data by Shane Safir and Camila Dugan or Jamila Dugan. So once you finish it, Dieta, you can let us know if you recommend. <laughs> All right, next I have Renee. Hi, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Renee Hernandez Greenfield. I'm the um, I'm one of the tri chairs for this awesome group. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am the director of the Early Learning Center that serves Tacoma Community College, um, and uh, my role I've been there for a while now. Um, my favorite book. Oh, I have too many and too many podcasts. So, um, my, my the I'm going to tell you two books that are 
uh, first one is life changing. The other one is just very super interesting. The first is um, Burro Genius by Victor Villasenor. Pretty much any book by Victor Villasenor is good, but as a teacher, Burro Genius is amazing. And um, and the other book I'm reading that is for pure pleasure and and why well, wouldn't say pleasure because it's a scary book, but um, it's a uh, it's um, the the stranger beside me by um, Anne Rule, very fascinating and um, very much not related to the work we do at all. <laughs> so uh, um, that I'm so I'm happy to be with you all here today. Thanks, Renee. <clears throat> All right, next I have, uh, I see um, it's showing up on screen as D, but I'm wondering, is that Dieta? Is that you, Dieta? And you already shared, or is, or do we have a D? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Oh, go ahead. It's not me. Oh, it's not okay. Yeah, no, there you are. Okay, so we uh, some uh, somebody's showing up. Uh, D's mini, so it seems like it's a device name, um, but we'll hold off on that for now. But if there is somebody named D yeah. behind there, yeah, I think it's D Hirsch, and she put her information in the chat as well. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, next we have next on my list. I have Amber Taylor. Sorry, uh, my name is Amber Taylor. I'm a child care substitute program manager, and I work with uh, the Department of um, Children, Youth, and Families with the child care subsidy team. Um, and my favorite book, I would have to say, I like the uh, Game of Thrones series. Thanks, Amber. Um, next, I have Catherine Simonowski. I felt shitty all weekend, yeah. and. Sorry about that. I was uh, double muted. My name is Katie Szymanowski. Uh, I am in Tacoma. I am DCYF's uh, Child Care Grants Coordinator. And um, this is so not highbrow, uh, but I've really been enjoying the Normal Gossip podcast. It's just like a story you would hear from your hairdresser or something, um, like about something funny that someone's cousin did or like a weird book club someone joined. So if you're missing that kind of like petty gossip in your life, I really recommend that podcast. Thanks, Katie. Um, next, uh, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Lee. I'm over in Spokane with Green Gable Children's Learning Center. And uh, I'm in and out of classrooms today, so I will be muted. Um, those are my fabulous dogs. Um, you know, I just finished the book Where the Crawdads Sing, and I really liked it. I have heard very mixed reviews and um, I thought the first 50 pages were a little, made me uncertain as to whether I was going to enjoy it, but I really did. And I think it's worth the read. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, that book keeps popping up on my algorithm everywhere. So I've been thinking about reading it, but I'll get, I'll check it out. Let's see. Next on the list is Elizabeth Truman. Hi, I was just typing, but I can go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth. I'm with the Pacific Northwest Montessori Association, and I'm the head of school at Northwest Montessori School. I just had a new baby. He's four months old. And um, so this is my first official meeting here with you guys. Um, but I have been reading a lot of, you know, new parenting and, and, and books about babies and, and uh, a lot of um, blogs. Um, so I don't really have anything that comes to mind. It's all kind of a blur right now, but, um, but learning a lot in a new way. I think uh, this has been really great for my professional 
growth and my professional development as well. So, um, but I'm really excited to be here with you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, welcome. All right, and I think, so Hillary uh, introduced herself in the chat, so did Brenna, and so did Rochelle. Oh, and it looks like we have uh, another chat intro. So Angela Benedict, um, Executive Director for Children's Village Early Learning Centers in Vancouver, Washington, currently reading Dare to Lead by Brené Brown. All right. And on, uh, next on the phone, we have Abdullahi. Uh, yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, so the books that I've been reading uh, these days are all about early, uh, early learning. Uh, my favorite book is The Great Gatsby, and then also uh, books about policies and language access and um, the language access for the Somali uh, uh, language at the DCYF. So pleasure to meet everyone. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, next we have Lorena. Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Lorena Miranda. I'm a licensed childcare provider in the Yakima area. Um, my favorite book that got me hooked up on reading when I was a teenager uh, was um, Gone with the Winds. I love romance since then. So my favorite writer is Julia Quinn. But, you know, since we work in child care, we have to be reading little kids books and everything about child care. But um, me, I'm a romantic. Thank you, Lorena. That's one of my favorite books of all time. So I get it. All right, and I think, so Susan, Rebecca, and Berta, all, and Gloria, I think everybody introduced yourself in the chat. Um, next um, on the list, Kelsey Boyce. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I was creeping on here and wasn't expecting to be called on. Um, hi, I'm Kelsey Boyce. I um, am located in Olympia, Washington. I work on the Early Learning Division Operations team, and my favorite book or podcast that I would recommend others dive into this summer. Um, that's a good question. I um, I often kind of am off in my own fantasy world, and I, I do like fantasy books. And there's a series called The Dresden Files that I really enjoy reading, um, but that's neither here nor there. Nice to see everybody. Thanks for having me today. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, and let's see. We have, um, let's do Amy. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Amy Russell. I'm here in the Early Learning Division at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Um, I am located in Olympia. Uh, my current book that I, I also just finished is Where the Crawdads Sing. Do recommend it. Um, Aaron, I suspect that um, your uh, media feed is filled with um, commercials, probably for the movie. There's a, the movie is about to be released this summer. So kind of excited about that, but happy to have had opportunity to do some pleasure reading recently. So yeah, great book. Thank you. All right, you guys, I'm going to read it. I'm going to do it. Okay, next let's do, let's do um, Jessica Hurtline. Morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Hartline. Um, I'm with the DCYF Community Engagement Team um, out of the Spokane area. And a book I recently read that I enjoyed was called Two Girls Down by Luisa Luna. It's like a suspense thriller type book. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, next let's do Jessica Spencer. Morning, everybody. Uh, Jessica Spencer, also with the CE team at DCYF, um, Vancouver, Washington area. And I don't have a favorite, but right now I'm alternating. I'm rereading um, Born a Crime. And I also started uh, The Last Wish. And it's pretty good so far. Awesome. Thank you. 
Um, okay, I think we, we've had some people jump on, so I'll keep an eye on that. Um, let's do, uh, next, let's do Deanna. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deanna Stewart. I'm the Deputy Director of Community Engagement here at the agency. Um, let's see, I'm located in Pierce County. Favorite book, there's a book I just finished called Verity, which I really enjoyed. Um, I'm typically not a fiction book reader. I'm usually nonfiction. However, it was, I try to mix it up. And then an all-time favorite that I actually buy, a lot of um, kids that I know that graduate is Life at Performance Level. Um, that is one of my all-time favorite books. So, but it's more nonfiction. All right, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, Nicole Rose, Assistant Secretary of Early Learning, and happy to be here with you today. I'm in Olympia. And my favorite book, um, or one that I reread often, is called A Map of the World. And I think it might be time to reread that one again. Thanks, Nicole. And I think. Um... Let's see, I'm trying to track, just jumped on. Oh, Angela, was that you that just jumped on? I, I see I caught you with a mid bite, but. Yeah, <laughs> totally fine. Go ahead and get the camera on so I can actually see everybody. Favorite book. Um, good morning, everyone. I have been into it and you know, for as much as me trying to say the right word of the title, I haven't been looking at it, but is it called Untethered Horse? You might know what I'm talking about, but that's the one I've been reading um, lately. And if I get the title wrong, I'll look and put it in the chat because it's something that has been a, a, a recent favorite, um, but I'll, I'll share that if I'm getting the name wrong. Yeah, please feel free to share. Everybody feel free to share anything in the chat too. This is just really Deanna and I's way of gathering summer reading recommendations. So, <laughs> um, and Angela Wheeler, uh, you popped on too. And I think there's one other person after that, but. I need my book, hold on. Um, <laughs> uh, Angela Wheeler um, from Tacoma Community College, so in TCC. Um, and I'm the program assistant at our college um, in the Child Care Center. And um, I've been doing a book read with my work and it is, um, it's a pretty good book. And it's called, I actually have it here. It's called um, You Are Your um, Best Thing. And it's the vulnerability, shame, resilience, um, resilience in the black experience. And um, there's a forward by Tanara Burke and uh, Brene Brown. Um, and we've been reading it as a college, um, like three or, three or four chapters as a, at a time. And then having open discussions about it, um, like once a month, um, and it's it's quite interesting. Um, there's so much talk about like intersectionality and um, just how experiences in vulnerability and shame just really truly um, uh, go to go together almost simultaneously all the time. So interesting. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I think that's everyone. Um, I'm not. Oh, wait, let's see. Jason. I see Jason there. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Hi, you. everybody. I'm Jason, uh, Child Care Subsidy Administrator with TCYF. I'm calling in from sunny Yakima. As I look out the window, it's mostly sunny. Um, we're having the most unseasonably spring spring of all springs here in central Washington. Um, my favorite book, uh, I'm also a nonfiction reader, and my favorite book is one that I go to um, for many things. That's First Break All the Rules. It's a book about management and leadership. Um, uh, so that gives you insight into my world around books. Um, I'll throw out a podcast. If anybody has a softballer in your life, When the Cleats Come Off by Ashley Burkhart is one of the best um, sports podcasts for girls. Um, and we listen to that quite a bit. Thanks, Jason. Let's see. And Dave, um, it, yes, I'd be happy to send out a list. Um, we can, 
embed those in the minutes or send them out with a follow up, but for sure. And um, and we have one more intro in the chat, Vicki Greger, Spokane Valley. Okay. Okay, I think that's everyone. If I missed anyone, please feel free to unmute and and share, um, or if you're more comfortable, you could share in the chat, but I believe that's everyone. Um, and uh, to introduce myself, my name is Erin Kerrigan. I'm the Community Engagement Administrator here at DCYF. Um, I am a huge reader. I have a ton, but right now I'm binging on um, old favorites. Um, sometimes I do that uh, just to kind of just when I just want to turn my brain off a bit. So I'm um, almost done binging all of Octavia Butler's books, um, which if anybody is into sci-fi or um, kind of post-apocalyptic uh, stuff, I highly recommend uh, Octavia Butler. But if you're in more of an escapist mood, there's, uh, there's nothing super productive about it. It's just really interesting. All right, so with that, um, we are gonna move on to the review of the April meeting minutes. So um, the minutes were included in the email that went out yesterday. Um, let's see if we have a link or if we can share it in the chat, I'm not sure. Um, there we go, yeah. So uh, a copy of them can be found. Um, there's a link in the chat. So I'm just gonna give everyone a moment um, to review those and um, then we'll move on to reviewing the feedback loop. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments about the April meeting minutes? Okay, then we can go ahead and move on to the feedback loop. That was also included in the prep email. Um, I believe Jessica will be sharing, yeah, Jessica just shared a link to it in the chat um, as well. Oh, it looks like the, there was something, I don't know if other people are seeing or experiencing that, but that link is a little bit off, I think, Jessica, the dot PDF part. I don't know, maybe it might just be me. Here we go. I think there was just like a, a space in the first link. So I just sent a corrected link in the chat. So if anybody had trouble with the first one, that should do it. So um, I just wanted to uh, kind of bring attention to a couple pieces of the feedback loop. One is um, you may have noticed with the email that went out, we included um, a copy of the emergency recommendation um, that the temper the FSKA temporary licensing subcommittee um, submitted last week. So um, that is um, in a way just a continuation of the ongoing conversation that 
provider supports and ELAC and other groups have been having regarding the background checks. And um, since the temporary licensing subcommittee has this mechanism for submitting recommendations, uh, the topic was moved there so that uh, they could make an emergency recommendation uh, that was representative of the provider voice. Um, so we attached uh, the copy of that emergency recommendation um, as a supplemental document there. I just wanted to bring your attention there. And um, another item uh, for the DCYF OSPI joint agency integration and inclusion work, uh, previously known as IPK. So based on uh, feedback that we received from you guys in the last provider supports meeting, um, we have moved that to um, a special webinar. So uh, we were hoping to have a date by today to share with you. Um, we probably will have a date by the time we send out the follow-up email. Um, it looks like uh, likely early July is when that will be hosted. Um, but uh, we will be sharing the meeting details for that webinar soon. Oh, and I see, um, Sandra, you have a hand up? I do, Erin, thank you. I have a question uh, regarding the FSKA grants and reading the feedback. I couldn't see what the difference was between that and the complex funds grant that you guys are doing. Can you explain? Um, I Amy or Nicole, do you guys want to take that one or is there? Can you, can you say the question about that again, the difference between the complex needs fund and, and what? The F, and the FSKA grants. Those are two different opportunities that are um, provided in the Fair Start for Kids Act. So we probably should have put FSKA also next to the complex needs fund if it wasn't there i apologize but there are two different grant opportunities the complex needs fund um, is to support providers serving children with complex needs um, to ensure that they have uh, what is needed to keep children essentially in care and and um, cared for in a way that meets their need um, and then the equity grants that is a separate grant that the early childhood equity grants will be released Mm, a little later, um, I think I would say spring, but it's actually, it's almost summertime. Uh, and uh, the equity grants essentially are to support um, providers serving um, by, uh, by uh, let's see, children and families um, who are BIPOC as well as BIPOC providers themselves to ensure that they have um, culturally relevant environments and supports in their care. Ah, thank you. So could we in the future put equity before the grants so we can keep them separate? Yeah, we will absolutely yeah, we okay, will make sure you. that we that we have them um, noted as, as two separate opportunities. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for that feedback, Sandra. Yes, I think that's a good reminder. I think sometimes we forget that there's a ton of acronyms and similar terms. And we need to be more intentional sometimes. Thank you. All right. Brian, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, just uh, two questions. One of the equity grants, um, there were supposed to be some more meetings on that before that has been sent out, or has that been, uh, has it already been decided on the protocol of what, how people qualify for the equity grants? Brian, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more of what other meetings uh, we were anticipating. We did do design sessions for the equity grants at the end of last month. And so we're anticipating doing webinars of what the design groups had weighed in on. But if there was something that was um, talked about that was a different meeting opportunity, maybe um, we can look back and kind of close the loop of where we might've got lost in translation or conversation there. So there was only one meeting for the design group on that Saturday? Was that yeah, correct? yeah, and so then they split out into different groups. So what happened is we brought it as a main topic area um, to provider supports, and then we, we had a separate subgroup of provider supports, and then we did a Saturday design session for, for the, the working session, I guess you could say, of the design piece. And so all of that is now getting compiled um, so that it can be released when the grant information is released. 
Okay. Uh, the second one was the needs-based grant was the other portion was for the students with special needs or requirements and it's only for subsidized uh, organizations. Is that correct? I can get this one, Angela. Um, at this time, what we're considering phase one is uh, for the complex needs fund uh, is for providers, yes, providers serving children and families accessing state subsidy. We will um, close this round shortly. And then in early fiscal year 23, which is likely the fall, um, we will open up another round and it will be broader. It will include private pay and FFN. Perfect, thank you. All right, do we have any other questions or comments um, regarding anything on the feedback loop? All right, and with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Brian, who's gonna introduce the next topic. Excellent, thank you very much. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak into here today, and we're going to move right into the 2023 legislative session planning, and we have the Assistant Secretary of Early Learning, Nicole Rose, joining us today. Um, she's going to go through and give some information. It looks like we also have an opportunity to break out into jam boards during this session. I uh, do want to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat so that we can address them um, accurately. Um, and then if there is a point that we can ask, ascertain some questions towards the end, uh, but let's give Nicole the opportunity to share uh, her information. So welcome, Nicole. Great. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so I am going to um, share a little bit about our decision packages today. And I want to note that there's a couple of things um, that we'll go over. And so we're going to go over some items um, that are going to be available for discussion. And then this morning, you should have also received um, a PDF that had some decision package updates on there as well. And so I want to talk a little bit briefly about um, the difference between those two things and um, then go over the items, like I said, where there's room for conversation. Um, one of the things we wanna be transparent about is where things are maybe already in law, like in the Fair Start for Kids Act, and we might be putting in like a maintenance level decision package or where um, ECAP expansion might already be happening. And so those things need to move forward. Um, but there are pieces um, where we certainly want feedback and engagement as well. And so um, I'll just note really quickly what's on the PDF went, that went out this morning. There were some uh, prevention decision packages that include things like home visiting, and that's continued expansion of slots, um, substance use disorder treatment, so targeting support for families at risk of further child welfare involvement, strengthening families locally expansion, so looking at some of those um, community networks uh, and some of that work that's happening in those locales. Uh, there are some pieces on here related to making child care work, and these are increasing reimbursement rates to the 85th percentile of the 2021 market rate survey, so bringing that into alignment with what Fair Start for Kids Act says. Um, and then just noting that because we have to look a couple of years out, there are a couple of things that come into play um, in July of 2023 and then July of 2025 related to copay increases and increase in income eligibility that are outlined in the Fair Start for Kids Act law that passed. Uh, we are gonna talk about some things related to childcare today though, that we're really looking forward to your feedback on. The other things that we are putting forward are looking at um, ECAP expansion. And there's a part of this that's really just about the slots needed to reach entitlement and then some continued conversion but there are some places where we will want some feedback um, from you all as well. The other one moving forward um, that I think is likely really relevant to this group also is the elimination of background check fees. So continuing um, what has been put in place for the past year or will be in place, I'm sorry, for July 1 that will happen for a year and um, moving that forward. And then there's the organizational license pilot um, that is happening as well. So these are continuations of things that were already happening or are things that were in law that we need to put what's called a maintenance level decision package forward on. So if we can go to the next slide. 
So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the draft packages that are um, out there for feedback. And part of what we want to really do today is get some guidance from you. And we have some specific questions on a couple of things, but then also just want to get some um, general feedback as well. And then um, after we go through this and we're able to compile all of this feedback, um, we'll be having the same conversation at the Early Learning Advisory Council. Uh, there's some other conversations happening with ECAP directors today as well. We'll compile all of that and then uh, look and see what we might need to change about our initial direction around decision packages. Okay, so just as a reminder, what you received this morning, those are all considered maintenance. And then the pieces that we're going to talk about today are things that are new ideas that we are hoping to implement. If we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we want to continue to commit to is really looking at access and affordability for child care. And the Fair Start for Kids Act um, took us quite a way there. Uh, but we know that there's still work to do in particular around infant and toddler care and infant and toddler access. So some ideas we have here are um, expanding early ECAP in areas where there is the most need, thinking about contracted slots to secure access for children involved in protective services, and then um, looking at an infant rate enhancement or continuation of an infant rate enhancement for child care subsidy. Another thing um, that we have often heard is how do we make sure that subsidy payments are sustainable? And so looking to pay providers based on child enrollment. So there's a sustainable subsidy payment out there. And one of the other pieces where we've received a lot of feedback is on overpayments. And with this, what we would really like to do um, is align our overpayments with federal requirements and so we're really focused in on things that would be fraud and intentional program violations. But if there was something that was administrative error, so that means it happened on our part when we were determining eligibility, um, something happened or a co-payment that we would not collect overpayments on those or unintentional program violations. So um, we think sort of that suite of items are things that will help make childcare more um, accessible and affordable. So if we want to go to the next slide. Then we have a package where we're talking about how we make child care work. And there are quite a few items in here. And these have to do with things like how are we really helping families um, think about how they are interacting with the system? And what are we thinking about as far as income and other things that we have to include? Uh, one of the things I'll note is that as we did this work, um, we were really looking at uh, what had come out of Build Back Better. And we're really also looking at our strategic plan and thinking about how are we making sure that as we create that integrated birth to eight system, um, that we're really supporting our most vulnerable children and thinking about um, how we're expanding access again to that affordable, high quality childcare, you know, ultimately to improve child outcomes. And so um, there are some big pieces that we've looked at to do this. So one of the things um, that is happening right now as part of the preschool development grant is access to child welfare early learning navigators. Um, and as that preschool development grant wraps down, we want to think about um, how can we sustain and increase the number of navigators. And these are folks who are really helping at the front end of services um, to make sure that they are connecting uh, children and families to high quality early learning program. The next thing we want to think about is how we transition child welfare, child care to working connections. And um, sometimes we don't talk a bit about this, but we do still run kind of two different child care programs right now. We have working connections, child care subsidy. And then if you are involved in the um, child welfare system and an out of home placement, um, you can access uh, child care through the child welfare program. And what we want to do is really move all of those things into one and provide families with children and protective services 12 month eligibility 
and really look at um, increasing that to going back to the past six months as well. So I think that for providers who, if you are serving children both on working connections or through child welfare, you're navigating two different things and we really wanna align these um, to better support families and to better support providers and in increasing sort of their capacity um, to provide services to these children and families. Uh, the last one on this slide is excluding child support as countable income. And so we would like to see this move forward. Um, if you have received child support, sometimes you know that can come and go. Um, but also this is something um, as we looked across some of our other programs that we're trying to take a look at. So um, want to make sure that we can attempt to move that forward. So if we want to go to the next slide. So there are some other things that we want to do here, and there's a couple of places in particular that we're going to want your feedback on, on this one as well. Um, we have heard often about allowing job search as, a, as an approved activity and doing that both at application and reapplication. And so um, we want to look at how we can do that. The other thing that um, we have heard about and Build Back Better was something I think that was uh, really trying to focus on was how do you um, authorize full-time care for all children? When you think about it, regardless of the parent's work schedule, if a child is in high quality care, um, that is really good for them. They're getting that great nurturing experience uh, where there's great child development happening and they've got that continuity of care. And we understand there may be implications there as you think about what does that mean if all of the children in my care have a full-time authorization? So we really wanna hear from you on that. And then we would uh, like to require only one parent to participate in an approved activity. So when families are applying or reapplying, um, one parent would just have to be in an approved activity. So the other thing, you know, we just know as we look at all of these things in the make child care work is that um, BIPOC families are disproportionately represented in both child welfare child care and working connections child care. And so we are really trying to break down some of those barriers um, and uh, make sure that families are reaching that point of self-sufficiency, um, have access to that high quality care and to really sort of break down what has been a pretty discriminatory system and rules and um, do things in a way where we're looking holistically again at um, what children and families need and what providers need as well. And if we wanna to go to the next slide. Homeless grace period. So this uh, is something that there have been changes around over the years and um, what we have really heard from you all and from advocates and others is when we look at that homeless grace period, um, we need to be thinking beyond the 12 months. There used to have to be a break and when they would access that homeless grace period and what we would like to do is say, let's remove that 12 month restriction. And again, really support families in getting the care that they need and doing job search, all of those things um, so that they are, um, having the ability to meet their needs. We also want to allow children participating in ECAP and Head Start as an approved activity for working connections because sometimes what you see is you have a family that might be participating in ECAP, early ECAP, Head Start, Tribal Head Start, mi Migrant Seasonal Head Start, and they are eligible for that program, but then something happens where they lose their authorization. And then um, because programs are keeping those kids in care, they may be looking at how are they paying that cost. And so I'm um, wanting to look at that. And I do just wanna note, even though the title says in ECAP and Head Start, we really are looking across that sort of suite of programs listed in that second bullet. And then allowing family participation in medical activities as an approved activity. Um, and this is something that we're exploring under CCDF. It's something that was noted in Build Back Better. And I think really, again, the notion here is families need care for a variety of different reasons. It might not just be going to work or to school. And we want to make sure that they have access to that care um, when they need it. Thank you.
if we want to go to the next slide. So ECAP expansion. So I talked about some of the maintenance level pieces for ECAP, and these are some policy decisions that we want to think about as we look at ECAP expansion. And in our strategic plan, we talk about um, increasing access to affordable, high quality care and all of the things that are needed to do that. And certainly ECAP is part of that continuum. Um, but as we look at this particular decision package, you know, we are really looking at how are we integrating many of our uh, pre-K programs and how are we taking into consideration what we know about dosage and access um, that we know is making a difference for families. So as we reach towards entitlement, um, one of the things that we know we need to do is continue to look at the slot rate for ECAP providers. Um, so when you think about things like Head Start, that slot rate is typically much higher than it is for ECAP. And so we are in the middle of doing a cost study to continue to look at this. And in particular, we know we need to look at the school day model. And as we think about what we want slots to look at, um, at entitlement, look like at entitlement, we'll have a pretty good split between school day and working day. So making sure the funding is right there becomes really important. The second piece is the readiness pathway. And this is really thinking about what is the technical assistance and capacity building that we need to do to support um, the various ECAP provider types. In Washington state, we have long had a mixed delivery system and I think that is a really great thing about our state because kids and families are choosing where they can receive services, whether that's in a licensed family home, a center, or an ECAP, it might be in a school setting as well. Um, and we know that um, as you do ECAP, those requirements are a little bit different than they are in childcare. And so we want to make sure that um, we have pathways for those that want to raise their hand to become ECAP providers that allow them the capacity in order to do that. Um, and I think the other thing I'll say about ECAP is that we know we are serving some of the most vulnerable and underserved communities and families. Um, you know, 81% of those families are at 110% of the federal poverty level or lower. Um, we have about 22% who were in some sort of child welfare involvement over the last four years, and about 64% enrolled in 2019-2020 were children of color. So um, wanting to really think about how we're taking that equity lens as we think about ECAP entitlement. The final thing on the ECAP expansion slide is um, sustaining the quality support resources received in fiscal year 23. And what I would say is as we look at everything from ECAP to Working Connections Child Care to investments we make in um, professional and workforce development or early achievers, we have to be thinking about all of the things it takes to do that, just not the slot of the cost that goes out to the provider. Um, there were dollars that were going towards uh, purchasing curriculum, child assessment, some of the other teaching strategies, resources. Um, that we need to ask for funding for moving forward. So that is part of our ask in that one as well. So if you wanna go to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I'm gonna pause here and see if you have questions before we go into doing some um, discussion. And when we go into breakout groups, uh, you will have a facilitator in your room just to help with the Jamboard. And I'm gonna drop the link into the Jamboard here in just a moment, but I wanna see if there are first any questions about what I shared, and then I'll show you some of the specific questions that we're really hoping to get feedback on. Nicole, I have a question. This is Susan. Yeah, Susan. Hey, what I'm curious about is, some of the data that was collected early on in the child care task force mm -hmm. from DC, the Department of Commerce indicated that the vast majority of families are in the middle that don't qualify for working connections, ECAP and Head Start. So what in your plan is going to kind of address, because it's still unaffordable for many, 
you know, child care is unaffordable for many in that, you know, middle group. How does this address expanding access or support, I mean, supporting the child care sector in that regard? Yeah, so as we think about expanding um, access for families, and I think that's a great question, Susan. There, So um, the Fair Start for Kids Act lines some of that out. And so in July of 2025 is when you see an increase in income eligibility again to 75% of the state median income. So we know that in order to have I, think I would say providers have more stability and families have access to care. It has to be a, a both and thing, right? It has to be, how are we increasing the income limits for families? And then how are we looking at rates for providers? Um, at this point in time, um, and I'm gonna lean on Jason to correct me if I'm wrong here. I think after the 75% SMI, really when we get to 85% SMI, that's the limit that we can go to with CCDF. And so we're sort of reaching what we can do with federal funds there. Jason, anything you would add? Um, you've got it right. And um, the Fair Start for Kids Act expands to 85% SMI in July of 2027. So 2025 uh, a step and then 2027 a step. So then my, my next question, and then I'll be quiet, is that what we learned during the pandemic is that the sustainability grants is what is needed in the childcare sector, not just during a pandemic, but overall. So funding slots for families or increased you know, eligibility because of state median income still is kind of like you know, the tip of the iceberg. We need some, I personally think we need some recommendations for, um, legislation that actually fund the sector, not the families. So I'm just gonna put that out there as a, I, I, I don't think we're gonna make the inroads we want to in, in terms of sustaining a, and building a stronger childcare system by only addressing that side of the equation. Yeah, and Susan, one of the things I wanna add, and then I see Brian's hand up, um, I would say we agree with you and we're taking that first step as we look at that 85% of state median income as laid out in the Fair Start for Kids Act. I think many of you all are aware of some of the cost of uh, care work that is happening. And so we also have where we need to um, submit a rate model. Uh, the Child Care Collaborative Task Force will submit their cost study and recommendations to the legislature in 2022. And then we will build on that study and develop a rate model that looks at that full cost of quality. So it is that two-pronged approach. Um, and the 85th percentile is what is in law right now with the also the requirement that we uh, submit a rate model for the cost study. So we know it needs to be both and. Ryan? Thank you. Yeah, I. I... I appreciate all the efforts that are being made. It sounds like it looks um, amazing in the investment, you know, by 2027. What's terrifying, I, I do have a solution. I found out something about this the other day. Childcare is not expensive. Uh, early, uh, early learning teachers require a, a great compensation. And I think we need to stop the shift and we need to shift our mindset towards how do we get people engaged in this in industry? Regardless of all the massive investments we put into it, if we do not start directly investing into our teachers and their workforce, there will be no need for any of this other component of that. And that's the part I wish we see more of that. Uh, direct investment, especially setting the, the education requirements and those pieces out there that we want those teachers to have, because I believe in that, but no teacher's gonna work for less than the compensation they deserve for their qualifications. So. We do need to come up with a better solution other than just say, let's make sure, uh, I mean, uh, tagging on what, what Susan had mentioned. Putting to the families is great, but there will be no childcare organizations out there because you gotta pay the teachers correctly. And, and there is no solution for that except for offsetting the cost directly to the families. And so I don't know if there's any, there's any talk about that, but the workforce is the most demanding component besides the background checks um, that's the most demanding component right now in early learning, I believe. So any thoughts on that, I would love to hear. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Brian. And I think one of the things I'll say, and I've got Angela and others on here too, we, where we've looked at compensation in a variety of different ways. And I think part of what I've heard from this group and from some others as well is that really thinking about it from not only just the, the subsidy dollars, which is currently kind of the mechanism that we have to uh, put dollars out there, but from um, thinking about the whole sector, so private and those that accept subsidies. So I just wanna check in and see if that's a fair statement um, first. As, as in, that there's a dip, there's a disparity between the two or? As in, as, as you're talking about compensation and our workforce, you're talking about the entire workforce and not distinguishing between the two. Yeah, it, it ultimately subsidy caps it from a business perspective, it's a very capped approach. And so from a private pay organization, the only thing I can do is directly offset the cost directly to the families. And I'm not saying we shouldn't pay our teachers I think we need to pay them. We need to pay them really well because we can't compete with other other industries currently right now, especially with all the extra, extra requirements. So I think universally across the board to hit the, the real question is both private pay and subsidized groups both have the same expectation to make sure we can highly compensate those teachers. But then on top of it, the education requirements evenly across the same the same plane on that too. So finding a pathway where we can lower the cost of childcare overnight if we have a direct investment. When 85% of my tuition goes directly to staffing, I doubt it's any less than the subsidized groups, except the subsidized groups have a ceiling where they can't ask for more beyond what it is. So the only way to help all groups is to find a direct investment, in teachers, especially if we're going to require education requirements to them. So one of the, I'm just, I'm cognizant of time. So thank you for that, that's helpful. I know there is some design work happening around compensation again. And so what I would like to do is maybe just put a pin in that for a moment um, and see if Julie and Gloria have other things they wanna add, but I really wanna um, get you all into breakout rooms to get some, some feedback. Thanks, Nicole. I, I just, um, I'm so happy to see that you guys are supporting or creating a proposal around making the fee waiver permanent for background checks. I am a little surprised that I'm not seeing something else though around background checks. Um, we've we've heard for several years that the whole, um, system like the computer system needs a complete overhaul. Um, I, you know, everything's coming to a crisis point with background checks in July, and I, I, I really thought that there'd be something more to help solve this um, and put money towards a new system. So thanks for the comment, Julie. I, I understand that there's been, I see the letter that went and I know we're having some more internal conversation around the July date in particular. Um, I think at this point in time, as we look at uh, the work group that is going to be started by OFM, um, that we're looking at how can we learn some more information there. Um, I, what I would also like to do is, I know Chris Parvin has been uh, working on this, and so I think um, I can follow up with uh, any interim or medium-term solutions that you might be thinking about. Right, the, the group is going to start, um, the legislated group or whatever, and then they make recommendations in a year. Um, and then if DCYF was going to put forward a decision pack package after that, based on their recommendations, like that's a long time. So it just, I was hoping for more like, let's get some money because we know that they're going to rec we expect that they're going to recommend an overhaul of the system. So that's where, where I was thinking and hopeful. 
what what I can do, Julie, is take that back to Chris. I think right now we're trying to look at, um, like I said, moving the fee piece forward. Um, and there is a, a space when we get into breakout rooms um, where you can put some general feedback as well. And so I can make sure to make a note there. And I saw so, the comments coming in about education awards. And I just want to know, I wasn't talking about those amounts, but if it was a sort of a mechanism like that. So Nicole, if I may, I know this is lost. Good morning, all. Sorry, I came on a little bit late, but um, saw the presentation. So happy about that. Uh, Lois Martin Community Day Center for Children in Seattle. Anyway, I was going to say I saw on your questions there about what is missing. So I'm thinking if we move into our breakout rooms now, then that would give us a chance to add that type, those comments there, I'm assuming. Am I right? It absolutely will. Hi, Nicole. This is Gloria Vasquez. Hi, everyone. I had, I want to add or present for the many concerns I have, but thank you to DCYA for being open and flexible to listen to us and let us to share our needs. I, I would like to talk a little bit about foster children. Foster children and sometimes family child care, we feel hands tied because we don't have much information uh, because it's, I know everything is confidential, but besides that, we know that what is, is the confidential and ethics, that's the good ethics. We don't have much information, but most of the time I will say, I don't want to, cut, to put every, every kid in this circle, but the 60% of the children, they have special needs in either or in either other way, um, we receiving the fee for the regular children uh, because they don't share most information with us. But we observing those special needs, and uh, we cannot do much when we talk with the social worker or we talk with the family. They say, I don't know. Working connection has established this payment, and we can not do anything. Besides. Uh, family child care provider and I believe other teacher in the centers we have in a, uh, we have to spend extra time and energy to work with these children because our job we love our job and we want to do these kids successful but we need to be paid for the service we do we need to to know the information and we tell to the faster program that these kids need uh, more support or is a special need. They know it's a special need, but they don't process the children like a special need. Besides that, talking about special need children is another process we have to have more easy because it's a difficult process. We have to fill, fill, fill up an individual plan for the licensor and only because they need to know, but which is another for another format that family has to request to work in connections. Like they have to send it to the family, and family has to pass the format to us, and we have to fill it up that information. Besides, they requesting uh, records. Uh, Gloria, Gloria, I'm yes. sorry. This is Brian. Um, I, I, you, you have some very valid points here. I'd like to move us to the breakout sessions. What I don't want to do is use up the last of our time that we, you, your points are very valid. I just hope that we can bring those actual points to the meetings into the group. And so we can get them written down. Um, I, 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 I apologize for interrupting you because I, I agree with a lot of the points what you're saying, but I'd love to keep this, um, have this opportunity to switch us over to the breakout rooms if we could, and then you can put that information into there so we can actually get it down in writing. So um, I apologize again, I did not mean yes. to interrupt yeah. you there. Brian, I was planning to express this because sometimes when we're in, in the room, sometimes they choose different points and we don't have too much time to speak about what is concerning to us. And we have to present these concerns. It's a lot of information like family child care providers for the Latino culture, Somali culture, other cultures we need to express because this affecting a lot to us. And that's why I want to present it, but I have to respect what you say. I don't want to contradict that. I hope I have the opportunity to express that in the 
breaking rules. <laughs> And, and Gloria, it, and it, it takes nothing away from what you're saying is valid. I think it all is. It's just, unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time on here. And, and you're right. I know we have a myriad of uh, concerns and, and situations, especially what I think what you're sharing is very valid. And I totally agree. If there is another way we could do this, anything that goes beyond the time, we will be happy to offer an opportunity for we can get more information. So I don't want you to be limited by time. I want you to be able to be able to get all that information in. So um, I would like to ask, um, I'm not sure if it's Aaron that's gonna switch us over to the breakout rooms or. Yeah, and I just, uh, before we do that, I just, I wanna acknowledge the, the workforce <clears throat> and funding issues that we have. And I think I'm, much of what you're asking for is to streamline and simplify the process. And I think that is part of what we're trying to take the steps to do. Um, as we go into those breakout rooms, um, the big questions we have for you is if everyone was authorized for full day care, what questions does it bring up? Um, a question about job search, we want to know what a meaningful infant rate enhancement about would be, um, and what would you need to consider serving children and families in ECAP or expanding your services for ECAP? So I will um, let them send you off to your breakout rooms. You will have a facilitator in there who can help with the Jamboard. We've got the link to the Jamboard in there again, and uh, we will see you back here soon. We are, we are returned. So everybody's coming back on their cyber journey. I know. I... Okay, I'm gonna get a nod. We, oh, oh, most of us returned back. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to move us forward. If there's not a, any objection or any needs that I did not um, take note of? <laughs> None, okay, all right, y'all. Um, Renee, again, one of the tri chairs, I just wanted to um, thank you all for spending a little extra time in those breakout sessions, uh, getting some, sharing more of your feedback and insight, very helpful, helpful very needed. Um, I would like the opportunity to share with you who are next up on our next agenda. We have adjusted some of the time, so I'll, I'll we'll get updated time see here shortly. Um, Rachel Brown Kendall is joining us to give us an update about early achievers. And that um, just a reminder that during the presentation, you know, type your questions um, into the chat box. And then once the presentation's over, you know, they'll be, answer, they'll be able to answer all the type questions as well as open up for additional questions. Um, and um, I'll pass it on over to, to uh, Rachel Brown Kendall. Thanks, Renee. I want to pause for a moment. Nicole, did you want to do anything to wrap up the last session uh, yeah. before we move on? Or yeah. thank you, Rachel. Sorry about that, Nicole. I did not. Oh no, worries. I should have jumped in when you when you raised it. Um, so I just want to one thank everybody for taking some extra time um, to go in and provide your comments and feedback and questions. And I see um, lots of different feedback and questions um, around ECAP and working connections, how those fit together, um, wanting to know around um, authorizations and then potential impacts for filling whole days versus half days. And so um, this is helpful information on here and uh, lots of good feedback around uh, job search also. Um, and questions about who would be responsible for tracking the activity, would it be the provider? which the answer to that would be no, the provider wouldn't be responsible for that. And then um, some comments about the infant 
rate enhancement. So we did get some numbers there. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, so I wanted to let you know, because um, there were some questions and comments about what happens next with this. And so we're gathering input from multiple sources across the early learning field. And then we'll go back and um, look at all the information we received and we'll look at um, our CCDF rules and regulations, um, look at any other laws and um, think about uh, if there are any places there where we would need to ask region 10 questions and then um, we'll get all of that ready for the agency request legislation submission to the governor's office in September. And we will come back and share what we heard and what we were able to incorporate and what we were not able to incorporate. So just wanted to close the loop on that. And thank you all again um, for taking the time to provide us with some great information. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Nicole, very much. Sorry again for missing that little that part in the chat box. And Rachel, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thank you. So we just have some brief updates um, for you this morning. We're in a, a really exciting place within our early achievers revisions work where we have uh, begun implementing our first component and are getting ready to launch our second. So I wanted to give some updates about where we are, where we're going, and, um, and then, Give an opportunity for our partners who are here in the room in the in the room <laughs> to share some updates as well. So first of all, we have a total of 359 sites so far that are in some way involved in the program profile. And so the program profile is the first component of the early achievers quality recognition process. And so this is that 360 interview that sites engage in um, that includes director survey or family child care owner operator survey as well as staff surveys and then surveys for families. Um, we have 227 seven sites have actually completed the entire process and 132 are still, still somewhere in the, the, um, the process of completing that um, program profile. There are, uh, out of those 359 sites, well, out of the 227 that have completed, 172 of them were our early adopters. And the thing that's really cool about our early adopters is these are the providers who said, you know what? Yeah, I want to be one of the first to step in and uh, test out this new quality recognition process. And I want to provide additional feedback. And so our early adopters, they completed the program profile process, but then they also agreed to give us more information to share their experiences with us. And so we provided additional, you know, kind of follow-up surveys for these early adopters to help us collect additional information about their experience as participants, about what was beneficial, what was challenging, how can we improve this program profile process? And so we are in the process of actually um, analyzing the information that we have received from those providers, as well as coaches who have been supporting those early adopters in that first process. And so this is really, you know, we're really trying to lean into a more liberatory design or a more human-centered design process of this revisions where we're doing uh, a period of testing and then collecting information and analyzing it, and then using that to then inform our next iteration, you know, so we can continue to improve early achievers. <clears throat> hey, Rachel, yes. can I just interrupt you for a minute? Sure. I'm just wondering, um, you're doing some updates and I'm wondering how long you expect the updates to go. We were set to be done at 11. And so I'm a, we're really behind on the agenda. Pretty quick. Okay. <laughs> Pretty quick. Okay. okay. I just want to just let me quickly wrap up here. Um, so the uh, anyhow, the um, program profile data, we are getting that information, we're analyzing that, and we will be meeting over the summertime um, 
you know, with our values and processes group, we'll be bringing information to the provider support subcommittee. Uh, so you can see what the information is that we are collecting. In addition to the information we're getting from the uh, program profile early adopters, we're also um, able, we were able to leverage the early achievers evaluation that, um, that uh, the Athena group does each year on early achievers to dig into this program profile early adopters phase so that we can have more iterative information about our revisions work. And so that information will be coming out in uh, July as well. We do have some early feedback from some focus groups that happen and it's been really exciting to see um, positive feedback as well as some really uh, informative, uh, constructive feedback about ways that we can improve the process. So that's been exciting to see that early information. Again, we will bring that to this group. Um, we'll work with uh, the community engagement team to find a time that will be best so that we can really engage in that. The next um, part of our early achievers revisions process is the video highlights. We're actually opening that component next week, which is really exciting. We've got a lot of providers who are very excited about the opportunity to start submitting videos and getting that feedback piece. So um, we are just really looking forward to that. Uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last two years really working with coaches to help them have a solid understanding of the revisions process, really engaging them in the process of helping us revise the system and then really helping them um, be confident in uh, what the different components are and how to support providers in this new way of doing business where we are really working on uh, strengths-based approaches and really looking at ways that we can recognize providers for the amazing work that they, were do that they are doing or that you all are doing, and then helping you determine the goals that you're interested in setting and supporting you in that way. So um, I don't know if Dawn or Sandy have any quick updates that you wanna share related to coach supports and the program profile and video highlights, but I will open the floor to you for a couple minutes. Just dropped it in the chat. Coaches are ready to do overviews and walk people through getting onboarded to Coaching Companion or CC as it's now branded. Um, so just let me know, reach out if you need a coach connection and we'll make sure to make that happen and they could join your staff at a staff meeting and provide that overview. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I think that covers it. Just know we've been providing lots of supports to coaches, and there's just been a we've seen a large increase in the number of users in um, CC over the past year. I would so in this fiscal year, um, there have been in terms of logins, two thousand five hundred sixty-five users have logged. Or I'm sorry, that was the previous year. Two thousand five hundred sixty-five users logged in in the previous fiscal year. In our recent fiscal year, that number is 4,930. So the numbers have really increased. People are really using it. They've taken it up and getting ready for early achievers. Um, and so the supports are there and ready to go and we're here to support you all. Yeah, so we'll come back with more information at your next meeting. Uh, and uh, we just appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. If any questions that you have, please go ahead and send them our way, put them in your feedback um, surveys that you get from the community engagement team. And we look forward to continuing to bring you news and opportunities to engage in process of revisions. Hey, Rachel, real quick, this is Lois with a question. I'm sorry if I missed this. Um, but are coaches available to for virtual connections as well for those of us who are still being super conservative with our unvaxxed populations? Yes, yes, Lois, absolutely. We have coaches are available for in-person and virtual connections. So um, we really wanna be responsive to provider needs as well as just being able to leverage as many resources as possible. So whatever you, uh, whatever you need, you can reach out to your uh, child care wear office and um, they can hook you up. All righty, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for all of the updates. Our meeting is about to conclude. We've got a survey link about the, 
the topics that should be dropping in the chat. Um, I think there's a Mentimeter link. Yeah, there it goes. And so let's take a minute to put some comments in there. You can use it several times. Oh, first of all, we're doing the productive. Okay, so rate whether or not you felt it was a good use of your time. Okay, it looks like only 12 people have done the Mentimeter. Um, 31 people are here. Okay, so now we're on the slide where we can share some of, let's see, one or more words describing how you're feeling walking away from today's meeting. Hmm. Okay, this is not exactly the feedback that I think um, might be wanted, but it definitely reflects that uh, not heard, pre-baked, broken record, short on time, background checks. There's a lot of concerned folks today. Um, okay, well, I do want to mention that our next meeting is August 10th and oh, there it is. And I hope everyone will be able to attend. Um, I also hope that we have good news on background checks by then. We did, you know, as everyone heard, the FSFKA group sent up the emergency recommendations and that included, you know, waivers to continue hiring like we are now um, because otherwise it will just cripple the industry. So hopefully August 10th, we have some good news and um, thank you for joining today. Everybody have a great day. Bye, thanks everyone.